Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, and all of you are welcome to my new broadcasting of A Disruptive Fate, Expect God to Interrupt Your Life. This is your pastor, Yeti. And today in our study, we're going to talk about the unsettling nature of fate. Our scriptures reading for today is still from the book of Hebrews, and it is chapter 11, verse 27. <clears throat> Moses left Egypt because he had faith. He was not afraid of the king's anger. He continued strong as if he could see the God no one can see. Real faith not only does something for us, but it also does something to us. Fate is not passive. As the old Lutherans said, fate is a perturbing thing. You are perturbing until your fate finds its object in Jesus Christ and then comes to peace. But it is first greatly disturbing, though it is also a glorious and saving thing. Moses was an Israelite of the covenant son of Abraham. Indeed, that was his condition at the time the story opens. He was out of the land of promise God had given to Abraham what we now call the Holy Land. And Moses was supposed to be in the Holy Land where God had told Abraham, his father, that he would have him. But Moses was out of that land, down in Egypt, and disassociated from his people. He was in the court of the Pharaoh, and his people were scattered throughout the land of Goshen. He was cut off from the life of the Blessed Covenant. He was living among the heathen, surrounded by false gods. <clears throat> I do not know where Moses got his awakening, but Hebrews 11.24 says, Moses, when he was come to years, the day Moses came of age mentally or spiritually, he became strangely troubled. He had, as they say, a good thing going. He was the supposed son of the Pharaoh's daughter and enjoyed all the luxuries of the court. I suppose he was dandled on the knee of many a king and potated as he grew up. Potentate, I mean. He had all that royalty could afford there in Egypt one of the greatest, if not the greatest country in the world at that time, and he could have taken things for granted. He could have grown old and fat and finally died in Egypt, still the son of Pharaoh, of Pharaoh's daughter. But when he came of age, he became spiritually awake. We are not told how it happened, but it started almost unperceived by him and then grew and deepened until finally he kept saying to himself, What am I doing luxurating in the court of the heathen emperor when I belong with my own people because I am a Jew? I do not know who told him he was a Jew. Maybe his real mother slipped the word to him when he was old enough to understand. There would not seem to be any reason for guessing about it, but he awoke to the fact that he was not where he belonged. So come a little step further. A great spiritual awakening. It was a great awakening for the man Moses. A vague but real hunger came to the man. It is a great hour for any man when he has a spiritual awakening. Consider the vast multitudes of people. 
They come and go and build and plant and reap and sow and marry and give in marriage and travel and work and sleep and play and eat and laugh and do all things that human beings do. But they never have any awakening at all by any inward voice. They are simply as God made them, descended from Adam and with their little education rub it on for veneer, but no spiritual awakening. Moses had such a spiritual awakening. He came to the knowledge of who he was. Before that, he just went along with things, accepting everything that was as it should be. It was perfectly all right. So he went along with it, it, and suddenly it came to him what he could be and was not, and what he was that he should not be. That is a holy day in any man's life, to see through the pretenses of the world. The world out there is running a confidence game, fleecing and staining and cheating and damning. And most people never see it at all. They are taking in just as in innocently as a lamp led to the slaughter. And some few people, by the grace of God, awaken when they come of age and get sick of their own sins. Many people are saved on such a moral rebound. Take anybody who knows he has sinned and who is sick with his sin. Upon conversion, his rebound is likely to take him way out beyond the border. That is exactly what happened to Moses. He said, here I am, living out the fat of the greatest land in the world on false pretenses, claiming to be an Egyptian when it, actually I am a Jew, trying to act like the son of the queen. I am no prince. I am just a Jew from the lions of Abraham. I think the word is loins of Abraham. And everything is wrong and mixed up. He came of age. Thank God. I suppose he began to hate the world and hate Egypt and hate that royal court with its cheap humor and hollow pretenses. It's lying promises and said to himself, I believe there is more hope in God and in the God of my father Abraham than there is here in the court of the Pharaoh. He came to a day that he marked on a calendar and said, Today I stop pretending. I am no longer going to pretend that I am something I am not. Today I say goodbye to the court of Pharaoh. Pharaoh's daughter was a supposed mother and would have been the only mother he had known. I am sure, I'm quite sure, it was not easy for him to leave her. And I'm quite certain it was hard to leave his friends. For he had friends and owed old Pharaoh and his people a great deal. And it was rather hard to walk out on them. But there comes a time when you are either going to walk out on some people or you are going to perish. Moses was caught in the meshes of the world. And the only way he could get out was by determined rebellion. The only people who get to heaven are conquered rebels. People who have rebelled against their sin. The rebellion is not against God. It had been against God, but now it is against the enemy, against the world, the flesh and the devil. Personally, I do not like to see a person converted too easily. The man who can be converted too easily can be unconverted just as easily. But a dull customer who comes hard when he gets converted, that is a decision that is actually true for the rest of his life. Paul was tough. And when he was converted, he never ever looked back once. He went straight forward. 
And so Pharaoh supposed grandson Moses was suddenly converted and said, I will no longer be a slave of the devil. I will no longer be a victim of sin. I will no longer let the world victimize me. And I will no longer bow down in the world. So I will say goodbye to my mother. If Pharaoh's daughter was still alive, as she probably was, he had to go and bid her goodbye. I am sure she did not understand. And I can picture a crying scene in which she, sa she said, Haven't we done everything for you that possibly could be done? You have dressed in the finest of silks. What more could we have done for you? Moses would have to say, Mother, I do not want you to think I am ungrateful, but I have other blood in my veins, and I am not an Egyptian. I claim my share of the covenant with my father Abraham, and if I stay with you, I have to give up the covenant. I will not give it up. I think he probably kissed and hugged his old mother goodbye, and then walked out and never went back until God sent him back to deliver Israel years later. When God sent him back, Moses knew all about what to do. He knew what door to enter, where to find the Pharaoh. He knew everything because he grew up there as a lad. God certainly picked the right man to send back and say to Pharaoh, Let my people go. Nobody else could have done it as well as a boy brought up there. They recognized him as soon as they saw him coming and said, There's that boy. He is older now, but there he is. When he said goodbye to his mother, he chose to go. Choose is one of the pivotal words in religious life. Not only did he renounce something, but he also chose something else. a little bit step further when you leave the old life there must be a renunciation and that is always a negative thing but remember you are not saved by what you renounce you are saved by what you embrace Moses not only renounced his life in Egypt and all it meant he chose Jehovah looking forward looking ahead as Abraham had to the day of Christ. He chose the covenant. He chose redemption. He chose to go along with the people of the covenant. He chose to pay whatever it cost him and suffer affliction with the children of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. We usually make out sin to be a great burden, but sin is often a pleasurable thing. That is why it can be so dangerous. Moses chose the pleasures of God's kingdom rather than the pleasures of sin. He chose the afflictions of the kingdom over the pleasures of sin. He esteemed the riches of Christ to reproaches of Christ to be greater richer than the treasures of Egypt. And God said to him, Moses, if you stay in Egypt, you will be rich. You have treasure here. But if you will come with me, you will have reproach. Which will it be? Reproach with me or treasures the Pharaoh? And Moses said, O oh God, as a son of Abraham, I choose reproach with the people of God. And therefore he united himself with the people of God, identified with them rather than continue with the pleasures of sin. Forsaking Egypt, and not fearing the wrath of Pharaoh. That little phrase throw in there seems to indicate what that when the king heard Moses was gone. He raised heaven and earth to find him. He was trying hard to get him back, but it did not work because this man was esteeming, and that is, he set certain values. We must set certain values with certain things. We must say, is this worth the cross to me? 
When you go shopping for something, you say, that was just a trifle and it does not really cost much. But if it is anything that costs a great amount of money, you do some esteeming and you do not grab the first thing and run. You set values and say, can I afford this? Well, I think maybe I can afford this, but I cannot afford that. What you are doing is putting a value on things. And Moses, the man of God, had to do that. All right. God said, you need to make up your mind. Are you going to loaf around, play and be at your ease with everybody bowing to you? Or are you going to join my people, my majority group? Minority, I mean. My mino- my no- I'm sorry. <laughs> my minority group, where you will be reproached for faith. I do not think Moses made up his mind in five minutes. I think he might have said, God, give me a day to think it over, maybe a week to think it over. I think it grew in him as he thought about it. His values changed and he left the place of pleasure for the place of reproach. A wonderful paradox. He finds the reproach more pleasurable than the pleasures he enjoyed before. This is always the way with Christians. I think there are hundreds of thousands of people everywhere who will not become Christians because they fear to reproach. The Bible does not have anything sympathetic to say about them. In Revelation 21 verse 8, it says, The fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and warmongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burned with fire and brimstone. The man or woman who is afraid to follow the Lord because he or she is afraid of reproach will suffer loss. God cannot possibly do anything for that person. However, the man or woman who will follow Christ, regardless of the reproach, will be saved. A little step further. He forsook. Then there are those wonderful words, he forsook. There is no salvation without abandonment, although the abandonment is not the salvation. There is no salvation without renunciation, but renunciation is not the salvation. Forsaking, abandoning, and renunciation are necessary before we can turn to the Lord. Nobody stays on a sinking ship when it is obvious that it is going down. The only way to to be saved from a burning house is to get up and get out of it. And we know that sometimes it's not possible. And that's sad. But so Moses foresaw, he endured to see him who was invisible. Christians are odd people. They see things that cannot be seen and hear things that cannot be heard and talk to a person that is invisible. They suffer reproach, go to church once and once a week and nobody thinks about it. You are a good citizen, but take yourself seriously and go to church whenever the doors are open. People will say you need to see a doctor. We must endure to see him who is invisible. And there are things when even your friends around you cannot be trusted. Not that they are false, but you do not quite know who to believe. However, do do not start saying, I don't see how sister so-and-so can do what she's doing and be a Christian. I don't see how brother so-and-so-and-so can act the way he does and be a Christian. We are not converted by looking to our brother or sister. We are converted in order that we may look unto Jesus, the author of finisher of our faith, He will never disappoint. 
There will never be a day when we will say, I don't see how the Lord does this. We will always say, True and righteous are your judgment, and the path of your commandments, therein do I delight. So let us endure, endure seeing him, seeing him who is invisible. And like Moses, you come out all right, and the glory of God will be our reward. Let God find your heart. And why I'm saying this like this? I know that God finds your heart. But sometimes we don't allow that Christ comes in. Don't be afraid. The work is finished. He did it. He died and rose. And very soon it will be Easter. So let Easter also come to your life. And a new life given by Christ. And open your heart for him. Like Moses had to make a choice. And he did. And it cost him a lot. But he made it. May God bless you, my dear friends. And my beautiful people. Blessings to all of you. This is your Pastor Yeti. I love you guys.